for coming. Uh, we're excited to have Robert uh, talking about teaching writing while standing on one foot. So we do have books for sale at the counter. Um, again, thank you for coming to Buffalo Street Books. Please welcome Robert Dan. Insight often begins with confusion and disappointment. There's an old Jewish legend about the necessity for uncertainty when it comes to learning something for ourselves. One day a non-believer approaches the great sage Shammai, teach me the whole of Torah while I stand on one foot and I'll convert. Shammai chases him off with a carpenter's rod, a sturdy measuring stick one cubit long. If you want to build an ark like Noah, you need a cubit long uh, carpenter's rod. Next, the non-believer approaches the great sage Hillel, teach me the whole of Torah while I stand on one foot. That's when Hillel utters the line that makes the legend famous. That which is hateful to you, do not do to others. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. A friend who practices yoga tells me that in yoga, standing on one foot is a posture of balance and stability. But in this story, and this is why it appeals to me as a teacher, standing on one foot evokes instability. The lesson is over before the non-believer has barely been on one foot. Unknowingly, he puts himself at risk to learn. Many students come to writing class like the non-believer. They dare me to teach them. But a successful writing class persuades students to put themselves at risk to learn. It's hard to take on the role of a beginner. Yet I know from experience that learning anything when I'm unwilling to take on risk, I improve the least. When I'm attached to the way I've done things or am unwilling to revise a particular lesson rule or principle I've followed in the past, I stand my ground. But it's a small patch of ground. When a student believes she has no ground to defend, all the ground is hers. The act of writing is no longer her adversary. When a student tells me how stressful it is to figure out what to write, or how unsure she is of where to start, or which idea to choose, or is worried that no matter what she does, it will be wrong, I always answer, you're so lucky. Why don't you just make a strong choice, do what you think, and then we'll have something to discuss. Or when the student comes to class and says she didn't do last night's writing because she wasn't sure what she was supposed to do, I say, the only wrong answer is not to give an answer. Make a strong choice and commit. Or a fretful student might tell me that she has no idea what to do, as if she's made out of wrong answers, and I say, that's not a problem, that's writing. Welcome to the tribe. Another friend admitted to me that for years she thought Hillel was supposed to stand on one foot, not the student. <laughs> that misreading appeals to me too. In writing class, I often find myself facing my students on one foot. A writing class is only an idea about what writers need to know until everyone shows up. When what a writer learns depends on doing work, knowledge appears when she writes. What she does defines her as much as what she knows. When I listen to my brother, my friends, and my colleagues, I wonder if the problem isn't that their employees and students don't know what they need to do, it's that they don't use what they know, or perhaps they don't even recognize that there is something to learn. Many of my students come to class believing that writing starts when they open a file on their computers and begin the first paragraph. However, I know it will be easier for them in the long run if I show them other ways to find material that can help them think and plan. There are drafts, but there can also be models, storyboards, and journal entries that trigger insights and advance the process. Sometimes students ask me where good ideas come from. I think they should be asking, when do good ideas come? I stand on one foot in front of the class, sure of the choices I've made, but uncertain about the ones they will make. That's the moment when I read their drafts and get a familiar sinking feeling. A whole month organized around the production of this draft. Instruction, practice, reflection, time to talk, time to write, time to reflect, and this. <laughs> Even though I know what to expect, I always wonder, have the choices I've made been good ones? Will the students' work get better? Can I make a difference? What is the right word to say, the right note to give? When should I ask questions? When should I just tell the student, do this, move this paragraph here, and see what happens? In a letter to Martin Buber, the great Jewish philosopher and educator, uh, Franz Rosenzweig observed that our attention usually goes to the first part, that which is hateful to you, do not do to others. 
But Rosenzweig thought the second part held the key. Hillel does not mean the rest is only commentary. To simply follow precepts is not to know, or at least not to entirely know, Torah. To know Torah is to know the lesson, but also to participate in an ongoing conversation, an inquiry really into the lesson's values. Writing classes are full of lessons, rules, principles, and resources, methods, and handbooks, but they teach the commentary. When I uh, wrote this, I really wanted to make it so that people who read it could substitute anything for the word writing and thought of it more as an exploration of the way people um, really already know how to learn, but sometimes go to school and school forgets how people learn and they persuade them. School persuades us not to listen to ourselves. So uh, um, this is called enfolded knowledge. At around six years old, when it became clear that baseball would be the interest that would outlast firefighting in my son's life, I had nothing to teach him. I never watched baseball. I never had a favorite team. I did my time in Little League and never, if I could help it, picked up a baseball again. So I did what I often do when I don't know how to do something. I went to the library. My son took charge of his learning, though, from the very beginning. At first, we played catch. I didn't own a glove, so when he began to throw hard, he contrived to get me one. We stood farther and farther apart when we threw the ball back and forth. I lobbed high balls high so he could learn to catch flies and skimmed the ball across the grass so he could practice fielding grounders. One day, he came outside and told me there was something he wanted to learn. He wanted to catch a fly ball on the run. He came up with his own way to practice. He took a position in a corner of the yard, directed me where to throw, and raced to catch it. This would continue for years until the yard was just too small for it to be a challenge. As for the rules of baseball, he picked them up on his own by watching hours of Yankees games on TV. Knowing how to catch flies in your backyard, however, is not the same as knowing how to play baseball. Knowing how to play baseball means knowing how to play on a team in a real game. So we signed him up for Coach Pitch Baseball. Coach Pitch Baseball follows T-Ball. It hadn't occurred to me that I should have signed him up for T-Ball. In T-Ball, the ball sits on a tee, the height of a kid's swing. It can take several tries, but eventually a swing connects, and even if the bat only just catches the top of the ball and the ball falls off the tee to roll a few inches from the plate, everyone cheers as the child runs to first base. In Coach Pitch, the child's own coach tosses the ball to him rather than an opposing pitcher. He throws it so the child can hit. This way, the child gets used to a ball coming at him. T-ball teaches a child a level swing at a stationary target positioned precisely where the bat and ball should connect. Coach pitch lets the kid connect that level swing to a baseball in flight. For parents, T-ball and coach pitch baseball games were almost like a picnic. Coaches and parents set up a little diamond in the grass. At one particular game, Reuben played third base. That day, I watched from the side of the field, very near the base, but mostly I chatted with Chuck, the left fielder's father. Across the infield and the outfield, we could see the usual array of attention spans. Some kids looked at their gloves. Some took the ready position they'd been taught, while one or two of the outfielders picked dandelions. Suddenly, to everyone's uh, surprise, uh, oh, that was you, the dandelions? Was that? Yeah. Uh, uh, suddenly, to everyone's surprise, a kid hit a pop fly. It sailed up the third base line right to Reuben, who stood as he'd seen the third baseman stand on TV, near enough to the base to reach it, but far enough to feel the ball hit between him and the shortstop. What happened next is what I remember. When the runner on third saw the ball sail into the air, he ran down the third base line toward home. It wasn't that the runner assumed no one would catch the ball. It was just that uh, runners always ran when, they, when the ball was hit. Ruben caught the ball easily, stepped on the base, and then trotted off the field even before his teammates realized he turned a double play to end the inning. On the way, he casually tossed the ball without looking uh, uh, to where the pitcher stood. Chuck said, wow, look at that. Look at what, I said. Chuck, uh, Chuck explained. <laughs> There'd already been an out from the boy who'd been thrown out at first. The fly Reuben caught was the second out. Although the runner on third was allowed to leave the base, if Reuben stepped on the base before the runner got back, the runner was out. That was the third out. So Reuben turned a double play to end the inning. But I don't remember this moment for his skillfulness. 
I remember it for his casual confidence. In one smooth motion, he caught the fly, turned, stepped on the base, and started for the dugout, making sure to leave the ball behind. Many different kinds of knowledge were enfolded into that one motion. A year's worth of routine and practice so that uh, once he saw the ball leave the bat, he'd move toward it, watch it, and position himself to catch it. Before the ball had been hit, he stood where he needed to stand, a position he learned from watching games and from his coach's instruction. He understood and could explain the rule that made the double play possible. He was aware of the runner to his right. At one point, to know the rule meant he could recall it and explain it to me if I asked while we watched a game on TV. But in the moment he caught the ball and put the runner out, to know meant to act, to understand, to be aware, to stand and to move. To know meant to do, and to do meant to think with his body and senses. The process of learning and practice that broke down what he needed to know into parts that could be apprehended now cohered. Another kind of knowledge made itself apparent to Reuben. His coach could tell him about it and gesture towards it, but Reuben would only get a full view as he practiced. Call it intuitive knowledge or feel, or call it eye or awareness. But one thing is true, that knowledge happened in time and space, in a particular moment at a particular place. Reuben expressed his understanding of the game of baseball and the way to play third base by catching the ball and putting the runner out. Of course, then, to catch a fly and turn a double play was miraculous, an event. Twelve years later, to miss that fly or to catch it and not put the careless runner out would be a mistake. Sometimes I write on the blackboard, oregano, canned tomatoes, garlic, olive oil. I ask the class, what is this? The students respond, a grocery list. Except for the one who cooks who says, it's a recipe. The others reply, but you already have to know what to do. They're right, of course. If you know what to do, a list can be a recipe. When you look at that list with everything you know, everything you know acts like a hidden commentary. After a certain point in any cook's education, some oregano, a can of tomatoes, a few cloves of garlic, and a bottle of olive oil set on the table is already sauce. Once I was in a houseware store looking over the wall full of peelers and egg separators. I was in my mid-twenties. Eavesdropping, I heard one woman tell another, I've closed two kitchens. She went on to specify that the kitchens were her mother's and her aunt's. My father saved a few things from his mother's kitchen, a food mill, two pots, and a sharp knife. The knife had been sharpened so often that the edge curved a bit at the middle, a little S-shape from handle to tip. The blade bent whenever I tried to cut with it, but my father always can make it work. One of the things my grandmother handled, these I think were the ones she handled most. They were quite meager in their way. I used the food mill until it broke. In a thousand years, these items might not be interesting even to an anthropologist. They'd be like oyster shells and antique bottles turning up at the site of a 19th century outhouse. They will never be ancient, not even antique. Tools find hands. Uh, they live in the hands that hold them. One of the uh, experiences that I had uh, in becoming a writing teacher was the fact that I found out when I was, in, when I was 22 that uh, I had a learning disability. My uh, a beloved teacher of mine, Bob Stein, that I had when I was uh, a junior and senior in college took me aside just before I graduated and said, you know, I think the problems you might be having uh, have a source. And he referred me to, to his wife, who referred me to someone. who, And I went through a period of time of all sorts of evaluations and found out that, yes, I had a learning disability. But 30 years ago, and it seems to be somewhat different now, you, uh, when you found that out, you really were pretty much on your own. Certainly, if you were 22 years old, you were really, that was it for you. You had to figure it out. So every time I sat down to write, and it had been true for many years before that, I had to think about what does it mean to know how to write? Um, and uh, and uh, uh, at the center of the, this book is, I think, is an essay about what it is to have to figure that out for yourself. And of course, what it taught me was um, that uh, it can mean many things uh, to know how to write. And uh, so uh, I, I want to end by reading just this one more short piece from this, this part of the book. Uh, 
um, about what happened when I began many years later. I'd like to say it was a couple years later, but it was more like 30 years later <laughs> that I, I began to uh, understand what it meant to have this be okay. So now when I think of my learning disability, I think of my daughter's bedroom. She's a neatener, so it's not the mess I'm thinking of. It's that nothing ever leaves the room and everything has its use. That little Playmobil baby and its car seat, all the teeny tiny plastic cups and plates that always seem to appear when the game calls for them. It doesn't matter if they are jumbled with trees and waterfalls and plastic wagon wheels put away haphazardly in the first place. I think of the way she plays with them, these little houses with all their tiny cups and saucers and little spoons and bowls. Playmobil makes it uh, its people uniform in shape and size, although their races and outfits change. Line up the figures next to each other uh, from, from several sets, knight, northern explorer, father at the beach, father at the barbecue, and you can't help but meditate on the transmigration of tiny toy souls. But it's not knights and explorers uh, she's playing, it's family. Dinners get cooked, kids go to school and fight with the friend who lives next door. So if she has a kid from a set in shorts and a kid in a set with a bathing suit, she switches kids when it's time to go to the pool. And if the hair color or style is wrong, she'll take the hair off of the first one and put it on the other one. Same kid. When I think about my learning disability, I try to remind myself of how her game stretches across her room and across the apartment. I find clutches of people on the edge of the tub because it's a day at the pool, or under a chair because they're visiting the city. They all need to go someplace. Her room will have three homes set up, as well as a school, each at a distance from each other, so that leaving one place for another, for another is a genuine going. When she doesn't have a house or, some, or something else she needs, and there's no cash to buy it, she simply presses something else into service. She'll appear in the kitchen doorway to ask, I need a pool with a slide. What would make a good pool with a slide? And I'll look around the kitchen and ponder and think about her toys and offer ideas she'll accept and reject one after the next until she finds the right one. Most often she'll make it herself, and when I see it, I'll know exactly what it is. There'll be no mistaking it for anything but a pool with a slide, even if the materials are unlikely and its shape a bit abstract. I hope she'll hold on to this courage, this feeling that it's nobody's business but hers what she makes or what it looks like. Once I found wet cat litter on the edge of the tub and rice, scattered in the tub and on the floor. <laughs> She'd been trying materials for beach sand. This was the one time I said, in the future, you'll have to use your mind for that. <laughs> I remember when it was all horses, maybe when she was six or seven. She had none to pretend with, so she made one. She took a stool and wrapped electric tape around the end of each leg. Then she found a forgotten uniform costume to drape over it, leaving just the head exposed. Over the body of the costume, she laid a towel, and over that, a blanket for a saddle. She tied three of my ties together and made loops at the end to make stirrups. She found a bit of rope for reins. Then she'd rock back and forth to ride the horse. She felt no need to show it to anyone. I walked into the room with the pocket doors and found the stable where she had a bucket full of oatmeal for feeding and straw I used to cover the garden beds on the floor. There it was, by the trough. Wh uh, who would get angry at such a thing, such a work? I fell into saying things like, make sure you clean the stable. Good work draws the people around it into its reality. I hear her through the kitchen door, going through the voices and narration of the game she's playing with her tiny people in houses, or I see her go past the kitchen doorway. Somehow, I'm always, almost always in the kitchen. I've heard a loud papa so often that I call, is that me or in the game, before I stop what I'm doing to see what she wants. If I enter the room when a game is in progress, it stops until I leave. Good girl. The privacy you need to do this thing is part of the process. I leave her be until absolutely necessary. Like, never wake a sleeping baby, so too, never interrupt a child deep in a game is an axiom parents know without being told. We've developed a routine. If I'm simply entering to leave a sock or a book, I act like nothing is going on, and she doesn't stop, embarrassed, until I leave. But the first time I found her lying on the floor near one of the houses all set up, quiet, staring at the, feeling, at the ceiling, I had to ask if everything was okay. She interrupted her trance halfway to say, I'm just doing the part of the game in my head that I can't do with the things that I have. 
When I think of my learning disability, I would like to remember the casual sense of entitlement my daughter feels that lets her solve problems about how to make the game work rather than abandoning it because a solution isn't apparent at the outset. And I think of how I come into the room to find a clear floor days after days when it was populated by families in their backyards and on trips to school. All the travels to the tub, beach, all the nights when she took 10 minutes to put the kids to bed, each in their own rooms and under covers, a ritual that had to be finished before she could get into bed, all swept up. I still ask with spontaneous concern, as if it had never happened before, what happened? You didn't need to clean up the game. And she says, matter of factly, it was finished. I can tell how deeply this is hers because she can let go so lightly. My journey through being schooled in writing has been a kind of folk tale in which I set out as a young man to some place I could see across a valley from my roof, only to ri arrive at it middle-aged. In such a story along the way, the, the hero encounters trials and teachers. He might win his name, he might win self-knowledge, and he might win the princess or the kingdom. What I won was this book. When I think of how I work with my learning disability now, I think of a box of broken crayons, all the colors I need. No, all the colors I can use. No, all the colors available to me. No, my colors. The colors um, I have. So it's not a box of 52 or 104 or 208 with a cool sharpener built into the box. It's a box of eight, eight fat crayons. I'm drawing a plan for this piece, lines radiating from a box of broken crayons in the middle of the page, lines I have thinkened. Thickened, really, but that's the kind of mistake that is the learning disability's gift to me. To connect the box of broken crayons with seven words, process, teaching, perspective, emotion, learning, attraction, doubt. And more thickened lines that radiate for them. I make more lines. Mark the painter sits next to me at the cafe where I write. He sees my picture making and asks me if I like the way the marker felt on the paper. I see you brought, bought Prismacolor markers, brush tips. I think, yes, yes, absolutely, markers or crayons. I just like the feeling of coloring it in. That's what I tell my students, he said. You know you're making something when you like the feel of the paint against the brush and the paint on the canvas. You love the process for its own sake. It's true. I fill it in each box carefully, and it's a beautiful thing. My mind settles. It feels very important and crucial. I can sneak around uh, words. Another day, the lady next to me says, those are Waldorf crayons. Oh, yeah? Well, the colors are really bright, and they feel good to color with. I used color out loud as a verb to describe what I was doing to another adult. One thing my learning disabil disability taught me, who cares? You know what they're really good for, she goes on, blending. I know she's a teacher. A good teacher invites the stranger in and honors the oddball who loves his work. I never tried that. She's right. Materials, the feel of things, words are material. They sometimes feel intractable to me, like the tunnel entrance is blocked and I'm digging out with my bare hands. I took these crayons from my daughter, who finished with them a while ago and hardly misses them, although when she sees me with them, she reminds me she might need them again sometime. Good, I remember thinking. Your tools matter to you. Never give them away lightly, as if they belong to no one. I had to learn this. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? When did, when did you start writing it? How long did it take to write the book? It took three and a half years to write. Mm -hmm. And I started writing it, um, well, finally somebody said to me, oh, you started writing this book 20 years ago. Ah. And once I, uh, I, I knew that, I could look at anything that I had written and everything that I'd done, whether it was for students or in a journal or, or just a few notes, and think of it all as part of the same story. Um, and that at a certain point, because I have to say, writing prose is not really, it's not really my native tongue. It's not something that I do that feels very easy to me to do. That, um, that gave me permission to just have it be whatever felt comfortable to me uh, that it would look like as a book when it was finished and to stop thinking about, you know, what it was supposed to look like when it was done. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a certain kind of satisfaction for you that's been brewing a long time, to have this concrete object. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I leave it strategically out on the coffee table from time <laughs> to time when people come over just so they'll ask. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>